Good morning, everyone. We'll get started here in just a second. Thomas, can you hear me? Or one of the externs who are here this month, can you guys just let me know that you can hear me and just type in the um, chat box? Okay, great. So we're gonna talk about Halix uh, Valgus and um, some emerging concepts. And I think before you start really on some of the newer literature, you have to understand uh, how a bunion forms and I'm a big principles person and then you can align the correction principles with how a bunion forms and, and the, the, this new paradigm shift that's occurred in Halix Vagos. So first on the principles, I, uh, there are three principles that I try to adhere to, to when I'm correcting a bunion deformity. First, I wanna choose a procedure that's triplanar in that nature Secondly, I, I would like to do a procedure that preserves the metatarsal head blood supply, and we'll, we'll talk about specifically what that means. And then third, if it can be extra articular, that's even better uh, to try to help with postoperative range of motion. And, and how a bunion forms is really important. This whole concept of frontal plane deformity is not new. It's, it's been around for a while, um, but Paul Dayton has, has brought it to the podiatry profession. This article from JBJS goes all the way back to 2011 by Pereira. And there are 10 steps that occur in the development of a bunion. So the first step is you get failure of these medial ligaments. So the medial collateral ligament, the medial sesamoidal ligament, and the uh, phalangeal sesamoidal ligament fail. The second step is you get movement of the first metatarsal over the fixed sesamoids. And that's a really important concept to understand is that the sesamoids stay where they are uh, supposed to, and the metatarsal head moves over the top. Now that can be due to an oblique or unstable tarsal metatarsal joint that may occur, encourage that movement. The third step is, and this is also a very important point, is the proximal phalanx is always going to follow the sesamoids. Since the sesamoids are, are in a different position, the hallux goes into valgus. So the metatarsal heads moved over the sesamoids, and the hallux is going to rotate into valgus because of that, uh, them being in their normal position. As the metatarsal moves over the fixed sesamoids, that leads to erosion of the central crista plantarly. So that's step four. Step five is you develop a bursa medially. Step six is a really important step that's sort of underappreciated and, and not given as much um, sort of talking as it uh, deserves is the long extensors, the extensor hallucis longus and the flexor hallucis longus translate laterally. So now they become deformity accentuators instead of straight sagittal plane movers of the hallux. Step seven is, uh, is a big step. It's where you get the pronation of the first metatarsal head that we're all, um, that's been brought to the literature. Um, uh, by by Dayton and is a very important concept also. Step eight, step eight is also um, underappreciated as well. The abductor hallucis, which is your only deformity resistor, slides more plantarly because the metatarsal heads move medially and dorsally. As it slides plantarly, it, you lose the only thing that's trying to resist the deformity and it becomes more of a straight plantar flexor of the toe. And then step nine, the weak dorsal capsule rotates medially due to the pronation of the first metatarsal head. And then step 10, you get elevation of the first metatarsal head with lateral transfer of pressure. So Dayton's first article in 2014, he showed that, that varus rotation consistently decreases the tibial sesamoid position and that frontal plane rotation of the first ray is required for complete anatomic correction of hallux valgus. And for example, he took 
cadavers and, and, and he had them rotated, uh, the first ray rotated in 30 degrees of algus and the sesamoid positions were all in the five range basically. And then he rotated them in 10 degree increments to 30 degrees varus. And just by that uh, uh, frontal plane rotation with no transverse plane movement of the first metatarsal, the sesamoid position went from five to one. It normalized just by rotating the metatarsal. So this is what we're faced with on, the, on this bottom left picture here. And this is what we have to accomplish for long-term success for hallux valgus and get the sesamoids uh, back under the metatarsal and get the metatarsal out of this rotation that it's in as well. And how much rotation did he average? He found that he averaged 22.10 degrees. And, and there are, are people who are um, resistant to this concept, who don't believe in it, and I don't, really understand it because there's a robust amount of literature as you're going to see. Uh, but essentially what this is saying is that if you do any kind of translational osteotomy where you cut and move or you take wedges of bone out um, and, or you translate a piece of bone on another piece of bone, there's no way you in this in the transverse plane, there's no way that you can rotate it 22 degrees. So I'm talking about Austin bunionectomies, I'm talking about Z bunions, I'm talking about base wedges. So those procedures now, in my opinion, become uh, procedures that no longer apply to this problem for hallux valgus correction. Uh, I really like it when I see multiple authors coming to the same conclusion. And Kim looked at the amount of tibial sesamoid position and rotation of the first metatarsal for hallux valgus patients and, uh, with CT scans. And they had a control group and a hallux valgus group. And their hallux valgus group had the exact same amount of pronation of the first metatarsal as Dayton did at 22 degrees, the exact same compared to the control group of 14. It was significantly higher. Uh, Kim basically had described four different types of situations with hallux valgus that were occurring. First, there was no pronation of the first metatarsal and no uh, sesamoid rotation. So that's uh, what I think of as more of a mild type bunion. Secondly, no pronation, but the sesamoids were subluxed. Third, there was pronation, but no sub subluxation of the sesamoids. Those two are what I would think of the, as more of a moderate type deformity. And fourth, uh, a pronation and subluxation of the, of the sesamoid, and that's where your more severe type deformities are. And you can see the parameters for considering a, uh, the metatarsal either pronated, or which was greater than 15.8 degrees, or a CT uh, four position tibial sesamoids sesamoid position of greater than or equal to one. So if you want to do a translational osteotomy, if you're just uh, a diehard Austin bunionectomy fan, well, that's fine. You're just understand that you're going to get it right 13% of the time because 87% of the time there is rotation or pronation of the first metatarsal in the frontal plane. And if you're not selecting a procedure that takes the pronation out of the first metatarsal, it's still, you're gonna have an un, uh, uncorrected deformity. And 72% of the time, there is sesamoid subluxation. And I want you to pay attention, those numbers are not the same. They're not supposed to be the same. Those are different segments moving in relation to each other. They're not locked together. So the amount of pronation doesn't have to equal the amount of sub, sesamoid subluxation. Those are two different bones moving in different directions. Um, the Austin bunionectomy has been around since the early 70s and, um, you know, so 50, almost 50 years. Uh, and yet the longest long-term study on it, it's only 7.9 years. If all this is true, if all this is true, if this whole thing about uh, trans, uh, frontal plane rotation is true, um, the, 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 the same amount of recurrence should be um, close to what this 72% of sesamoid position is because remember the hallux always follows the sesamoids. And um, this is a study from Foot and Ankle International in 2015 that looked at, it's the longest long-term follow-up on Austin bunionectomy and recurrence is described as um, a hallux valgus angle greater than 15 degrees and it's exactly the same and, and, and at 73%. And, and, and I find that very reassuring. That means we are on the right track. 
that this whole thing with frontal plane rotation is real and, and, and that uh, we are getting a deeper, more thorough understanding on hallux valgus. Uh, several other authors have looked at this as well. Campbell uh, used uh, 3D modeling for this to look at the pronation of the first metatarsal, so they had a 3D CAD um, to, to examine it. Um, they had uh, also a hallux valgus group and a control group, uh, and then they looked at the amount of rotation in the first metatarsal pronation and the, the pronation of the hallux. And, and some of the people who don't believe in this concept like to use this article to show that there was no uh, relationship between the, or correlation between the amount of pronation in the great toe and the hallux valgus. They just don't understand what that means. They're not supposed to be the same. Those two segments are moving independent of each other. And if you look in the metatarsal pronation of the hallux valgus group, it's 27.3 degrees. That's a little more than Dayton and a little more than Kim found, but it's still in the ballpark. Um, <clears throat> so um, I, I think this only actually uh, confirms what's going on. It doesn't um, say that, no, that's not true. And their, their, clinical, revel, uh, their clinical summary was that uh, you have to um, correct the, the, all three planes that this is a three-dimensional deformity to restore normal anatomy. Conti also looked at this, um, the effect of the lapidus procedure on pronation of the first ray in hallux valgus. Um, and that was the, uh, this is the first study to describe the postoperative pronation on the first ray in patients with hallux valgus on weight bearing CTs. And, and if you look at this, uh, their preoperative um, uh, uh, hallux valgus angles and IM angle. And then if you look at the amount of uh, pronation in the first metatarsal uh, and how it went down, they were in that same range uh, as, as Campbell's study, um, 29 degrees to 20 degrees uh, postoperatively, um, and then kind of in the Kim results as well. They suggested that the lapidus was an effective tool to change the pronation of the first ray when patients with hallux valgus, and there was a significant decrease in the pronation with the use of a lapidus. And uh, the one thing that they said that was different than Dayton was that the pronation, change in the pronation was not associated with change in sesamoid. So there's a little bit of difference of opinion there. The correction of the sesamoid subluxation may be more related to the IM angle uh, correction than the pronation. So there's a little bit of a difference of opinion on that. Um, and they also said that you can correct the amount of pronation without knowing the exact true number preoperatively uh, with good clinical results. Um, and without the need for supplemental alignment guides, you can just do this with the operative technique. Um, it's interesting, they didn't find any correlation between pronation of the first ray and pre-op uh, IM angle and hallux valgus angle. Um, and they felt that that was an independent deformity. And you'll see that um, other studies have actually uh, disagree with that and show a relationship between those three uh, components. Chiotes and Foot and Ankle International looked at this also with weight-bearing CTs. And they looked at, um, patients with pes planus and cavo varus that had bunion deformities. So essentially what they found was if you have a flat foot in a bunion, there's even more rotation of the first metatarsal than like a cavo foot with a bunion. So that uh, instability of the medial column led to more rotation of the first metatarsal. Meyer from Philadelphia actually is the person who looked at this and try to see if there's any kind of relationship between the transverse plane, the sagittal, and the frontal plane and, um, in 2019. And what they, they said was, there's objective evidence in the support of the triplanar component, component of hallux valgus that is consistent and statistically significant that as the transverse plane deformity of the first metatarsal and hallux phalanges increased, the frontal plane deformity of the sesamoids also tended to increase and the first metatarsal inclination angle tended to degrees. So the first metatarsal went up. 
uh, and they, their conclusion was that we believe this reinforces the evaluation of this deformity with emphasis on all three planes. So they linked all three of them together. So this is a video, and this is a proximal osteotomy at the metatarsal base. So the very first thing I want you to concentrate on here is just look at the dorsal medial prominence. And you can see by just rotating this in the frontal plane, the dorsal medial prominence, really, which really isn't in this particular case, disappears. And that's because it's just the, the condyle of the metatarsal. So as you derotate it, the condyle goes back into its normal anatomical position and you're not seeing it radiographically. Now, the second thing I want you to look at are the sesamoids. Watch how by just rotating this in the frontal plane, the sesamoids are back under the metatarsal head like they're supposed to be without any real transverse plane movement, which is unlike what Conti was saying, but this is just rotating with that um, bone clamp in the, in the transverse plane. The third thing I want you to look at is the lateral aspect of the first metatarsal before they rotate it. Look how, see it's rounded there. Now watch as they, as they rotate it, it squares off. And, and so if when you look at an x-ray with a, a moderate or severe bunion, it looks like the lateral side of the metatarsal head is rounded. And that's, it, it's not rounded. If you were to take a first metatarsal out of a cadaver and look at it from the front, the lateral side isn't rounded, it's squared off. So what you're seeing radiographically is the plantar lateral condyle due to the rotation of the bone that makes the, the metatarsal head look rounded on the x-ray. And when you take that rotation out of the bone, you see what the normal anatomical contouring of the lateral aspect is, which is squared off. So that's how intraoperatively with C-arm fluoroscopy that you can tell that you have the deformity fully corrected. So, is the first metatarsal caniform joint really the problem? And, and if it is, do we have to work there? So Patel and JFAS in 2019 looked at the obliquity of the first met caniform joint and looked at it as a risk factor for developing hallux valgus. And they looked at it in the AP view uh, or the transverse plane and the sagittal plane. <clears throat> and Basically, they did not, their, their, their study didn't demonstrate any statistical significance for a relationship between the obliquity of the first met caniform joint and the common radiographic parameter and, and the common radiographic parameters of hallux algus. Although not specifically studied here, the results might potentially indicate that as opposed to structure, the developmental pathogenesis of hallux algus is. Um, uh, it's a developmental uh, pathogenesis for hallux valgus. So this obliquity of, of the first met cuneiform joint, that, you know, that's one of the theories that leads to hallux valgus. They just didn't find that in the study. So what we've been talking about is there's a twist occurring within the segment of the first ray. So it's a versional change, a versional twist. But what if this is a, or a component of this is a torsional twist. So an actual twist within the bone. So let's say the whole first ray is rotated in the frontal plane, but what if some of that rotation is actually a twist that's occurring within the first metatarsal? And if there's an actual twist within the first metatarsal, doesn't that mean that we need to select a procedure that's going to untwist the first metatarsal to fully correct the deformity? So Oda looked at this, and they had a control group and a, and a patient group with hallux valgus, and they used 3D CT. And they looked at the distal aspect of the first metatarsal in relationship to the proximal aspect and for any kind of torsion or twist. And, and what they found was um, a significant difference in the hallux valgus patients compared to the control group. So there's about 18 degrees of torsional twist within the hallux valgus group and only about four, five degrees in the control group. Um, so there's a significant amount of eversion that was going on here. Um, and um, their study says, well, maybe part of this whole frontal plane deformity thing is actually a twist within the bone. So it's 18 degrees of that 22 degrees that Kim and and, and, and Dayton were saying in that 28, 29 that Campbell and Conti were saying, maybe a lot of it is this twist that's occurring within the first metatarsal. And they showed that this twist was occurring in the proximal two-third distal one-third junction is where it was occurring. 
and and they weren't sure was this something that you know people were born with or is this something that occurs developmentally due to foot function but here you can see in the control group uh, this drawing showing the relationship of the bases of the metatarsals and the distal metatarsal heads and how the first and uh, metatarsal the base and the first metatarsal head are in this uh, normal relationship that, uh, across the board. And in the hallux valgus group, there was this twist that was occurring distally. So all this comes back to recurrence. And the question is, okay, well, you know, if I don't select a procedure that corrects in the frontal plane and I get recurrence, so I do an Austin and 72% or 73% of the time, the bunion comes back, does that really matter as long as the patient doesn't have pain? And, and that's what the group from Chicago with, um, uh, uh, looked at with Adam Flesher in the group. Uh, most of these uh, doctors work with the WILD group. And uh, so they looked at patient outcomes with a, a, a FAAOS uh, scores and radiographic parameters. And essentially kind of what they said is that no, it doesn't really matter that we shouldn't be so zoned in on x-ray findings and just look at patient satisfaction. Well, um, I respectfully disagree with this because I've had this, un I've been in practice for 30 years, for those of you who don't know me, uh, and I've had this un uh, uncomfortable conversation with patients when I've done hallux valgus surgery on them and it had a recurrence. The thing is you have to remember that these patients are first paying you to fix a problem. Secondly, they are taking off work to have the surgery done and to recuperate in most cases. Third, they're undergoing a general anesthetic to have the procedure done or some type of anesthesia. Fourth, they're going through a rehab. And, you know, there, and five, there's a, there's, a extens there's a pretty significant cost involved often for them out of pocket. And it's just, I like to equate this to, if you take your car into the auto shop to have it fixed, you expect the problem fixed. You don't expect it to be partially fixed. And there are no other, I cannot think of any other surgical procedures, like if we're going to do a flat, a pediatric flat foot correction, we, we, it, we, we aren't okay with the heel being in, you know, moderately better. We expect the calcaneus to be perpendicular to the ground. We don't, we don't want the forefoot varus to be partially corrected. We want the forefoot to be parallel to the rear foot. If I'm gonna lengthen the posterior muscle group, I expect plus five degrees of dorsiflexion afterwards. So I don't know why for this particular problem, we're like, okay, if it's marginally better and it comes partially comes back where everything else is, we're not. Um, what is the role of hypermobility? And is, you know, if we have a, a bunion, does that always mean that there's hypermobility? And does that mean that we always have to do a lapidus? This is an article that Tom Rukas was a senior author on. He does not like the term hypermobility. I think I like to kid him about this. He, he, um, this was probably a, a tough article for him to accept that he, when he went through the data. So this is, was a systematic review and meta-analysis. Um, they, um, what they found was, if you look at hallux valgus patients compared to patients without hallux valgus, that there was 3.6 millimeters more motion occurring along the first ray than uh, the control groups. And that was statistically significant. There was a lot of heterogeneity amongst those studies. So when they adjusted the heterogeneity, it went down to 2.94. So let's just say three as we go forward with this conversation. So yes, patients with hallux valgus had more first ray motion than control groups, and it was about three millimeters more. Um, they said, well, there's a lot of articles, and we're gonna talk about some of these, that say, you know, just realigning the deformity stabilizes the first ray, and you, you probably don't need to do anything for that little amount of excessive motion. Um, but they kind of said, well, you know, if there's an excess of more than that, you can still go ahead and do a lap this. Uh, so Kimura uh, wrote this article from JBGS in 2018, and they looked at the, um, the emotion that occurs in the first ray. And the thing that you have to remember is all that emotion, all that motion is not occurring at the first met cuneiform joint. It's going through the navicular cuneiform joint and the talonavicular joint also. In fact, Christensen did an article in a series that he wrote in the late 1990s, early 2000s, which I talk about a lot. And they show that most of that motion occurs at the NC joint. The second most occurs at the first mat and the least amount occurs at the TN, but the motion is spread out over all three joints. And this Kimura article, they said, displacement is occurring at multiple joints along the first ray. 
Um, so let's say we have that three millimeters of motion. How much of that's actually occurring specifically at the first metconeoform joint? And is that then statistically significant that says, well, look, maybe we don't have to do a lapidus to fix this problem because the amount of motion that's actually occurring at this first mechaniform joint is really relatively small and inconsequential. Um, this is one of those articles from that uh, Christensen series in the late, or late 1990s, early 2000s. Um, and on this one, what they did is they, they had these cadavers and in their study, what they did is they put uh, sensors on the first mat, first cuneiform, the vicula, and the talus, and they did different things to see how it affected the medial column of the foot. And this is part two of that study um, where they had uh, cadavers with deformities. And just by correcting the deformity, the hallux valgus deformity, it plantar flex the first ray by 26% more. And so if we're just correcting the deformity, it gets the first ray down. Is that then enough to stabilize the meal column where you don't have to do anything uh, to the uh, first mechaniform joint? Coughlin also looked at this and, and he just looked at doing um, a crescentic type osteotomy proximally with a distal soft tissue procedure. And he noted uh, a significant reduction in first ray mobility by just with that crescentic osteotomy and getting the, the segment realigned. And he, he felt like there were these intrinsic anatomic features that pay, play a, a role in first ray mobility and that by realigning things, it stabilizes that medial column of the foot. And this is an article that I think is really eye-opening and sort of brings this point home. This is from Farber and, J and Bone and Joint Journal in 2013. And this has a, 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 an eight to 11 year follow-up. And, and basically there were two groups of patients that had hallux valgus surgery. One group received a homin osteotomy, which is just a straight transverse through and through. And then one group had a lapidus. And they looked at AOFAS scores, VAS scores, uh, IM angle and hallux valgus uh, angle. And within the cohort, there's about, there are 45 in the homing group and 46 in the lapidus group. There was a, sub, a subgroup within each group that they considered hypermobile based on their uh, examination. So there had the subsection of hypermobile subgroup. And basically at 10 years out, there was no difference radiographically or with patient outcome measurements. And so they, they said this, the study does not support the theory that hallux valgus uh, deformity patients uh, is related to hypermobility of the first met cuneiform joint that requires fusion. So, you know, unlike what industry is pounding down everybody's throat, this is not a one size fits all. Um, there are over 140 different procedures or variations for hallux valgus correction described in the literature. And industry is driving this message that you have to do a lapidus fit to fix, that's the only choice now. That is not true. There's not a one size fits all. Now, we'll discuss which ones make sense here in a minute, but it's not just one, there are more options than one. So the other thing that industry is trying to pound home is that, well, this is the axis, uh, this is the cora for hallux valgus. So we know that, you know, if that's where the apex of the deformity is, that's where we should be correcting it. Is that really true? is the first metconeiform joint really the apex for hallux valgus? So just a quick review, the mechanical axis is of a bone is the central point of the proximal joint and the central point of a, the this distal joint. And so like if you're in a car accident and you break your femur and it heals in an S, as long as your hip and your knee are aligned perfectly, it doesn't matter other than the limb length inequality that might occur from it, but um, that they're gonna function normally. The anatomical axis is the bisection of the bone. It's much less important than the mechanical axis. The mechanical axis is more important from a functional standpoint. And yes, ideally, particularly in long bones, we want to correct deformities at the cora. Um, that allows us to correct the deformity uh, without translation. So Laporta looked at this, what was the mechanical axis of the first ray and the axis of hallux abducto valgus? They're not the same. That's the one thing you need to understand. The first ray goes all the way back to the talus and it ends at the base of the proximal phalanx. Remember the sesamoids do not move. The hallux follows the sesamoids, so it's always gonna stay where the sesamoids are. 
in the AP view. And the same uh, angle can be, uh, so you can do a second ray axis. And this difference between the first ray axis and the second ray axis is consistently around 11 degrees, even in, in the presence of Halix August, because those are based off the proximal phalanx, not off the metatarsal head, and the proximal phalanx stays with the sesamoids, which do not move. And other studies have shown this and reproduced these findings. So the mechanical axis of the medial column or the first ray is this line from E to A, um, which is normally parallel to the anatomic axis. And you'll see in a minute that when we have Halix valgus, it's not. And then you have the second ray axis, and it gives us this angle that's always there. And that's, just kind of think of that as the angle of the sesamoids related to the second ray, because remember the hallux follows the sesamoids. So when we have a hallux valgus deformity, we now get a, um, a, a different uh, line involved, which is this line from B to D, which becomes the um, um, axis of the, of, of the first ray, um, the anatomic axis of the first ray, and, and, and that crosses, or of, of the first metatarsal, sorry, that crosses the first ray axis at point D. And, and what that means is that point D is the cora of the deformity, so it's the proximal lateral first cuneiform. And guess what? There are no procedures that correct at the proximal lateral first cuneiform. Uh, so that means that it doesn't matter what procedure that we select, that there's always going to be some sort of angulation and translation involved. And you'll hear some of the people who are really big supporters of the lapidus for this. They won't use, they actually will now qualify when they start talking about the, the cora. They'll say like the anatomic cora and, and, or, um, you know, the apex of the deformity. But the, the true cora and core is based off radiologic evaluation is at the proximal lateral uh, first cuneiform. So they kind of play around with the words a little bit on it. As far as the first metatarsal head arterial supply, this nutrient artery, which um, runs from the lateral aspect um, into the lateral aspect of the first metatarsal head and it comes into the metatarsal and branches and goes distally and proximally. And that occurs at the proximal two-third distal one-third junction. And that's kind of in an area at risk, particularly for distal metatarsal osteotomies, particularly for chevron. Um, this, this, this has been shown to be very important to vascularity for the distal aspect of the metatarsal uh, head. Uh, and I, I have done well over a thousand Austin bendinectomies in my career because that was the, the workhorse for years and years and years. And um, I've had one or two uh, AVNs from my Austin bunionectomies, and it's just a devastating problem uh, to happen. And a lot of it has to do with um, not respecting this nutrient artery. And it's at risk from the saw blade within Austin. Um, these authors in, in this study um, did say that you also have to be careful when you're doing a lateral release with that, that nutrient artery and not get too nuts with it. Um, but it may be at less risk with an, the MIS approach. Um, so what are our triplanar? So we have this 140 options. So distally, there are three that make sense that allow for triplanar correction. The Wilson or the Homan, the Siri or the Bosch, which is basically a Homan procedure, but it's an MIS approach, or the Mitchell osteotomy. Proximally, there's the crescentic or a crescentic-like osteotomy. So there's different variations of this type of approach. Um, and then you have your arthrodesis procedures. You have your lapidus and your first MPJ arthrodesis. So those are really the five that, you know, I think make sense and align with this paradigm shift that's occurred uh, in, in Halix Vaga surgery. And the thing about lapidus is, it's a difficult procedure to do well. I do ABFAS case reviews. I've seen a lot of uh, really poorly done lapidus and some pretty, pretty well done lapidus. I, I see them here when I get secondary second opinions. Um, in surgery, sometimes it's a fight with a lapidus to get things where you want it. Uh, so it's not as easy as everybody makes it out to be. I think it's one of the more difficult procedures to really do well. This is a great article and we're not gonna go a deep dive into it. We're gonna concentrate on the lapidus part of this article only. Um, so this is looking at all Bunyan articles, or not all of them, but 229 Bunyan articles over 49 years 
16,000 surgical procedures with 13,000 patients. So there's a tremendous amount of data here to look at. Um, so the lapidus was 1.9% um, of the feed or 2.1% of the total patient cohort. Um, first, post-operative dissatisfaction by surgery type, it was in the top four. You know, so there was a fair amount of dissatisfaction comparative to other uh, types of procedures. Next was post-operative pain, which was relatively low, which also may have meant that not very many, only two of the studies used, um, used the, uh, that in their evaluation of lapidus that they looked at. Um, Post-op metatarsalgia was pretty low for it. The post-operative recurrence rate was also relatively low at 1.7. Intraoperative nerve damage was um, actually pretty high. It was the second highest. Uh, and that's because that nerve, um, the, it's the dorsal, it's a, um, the dorsal medial branch to the hallux. So it's, it's a proper dorsal medial branch to the hallux. It goes uh, right through the, where that in, uh, uh, operation is being done. And it's, you have to be very careful with it. And you have to make sure that you protect it during the procedure. Postoperative infection actually was the highest. And I, I think, and this is just my opinion, that when we're doing a lapidus, we um, try to make the incision too small and we put a lot of tension on the skin edges. And, and that leads to wound dehiscence, which then leads to wound infection. Um, and so, and actually, it's interesting because there's a push to kind of going to doing this minimal incision approach to lapidus. And I find that very interesting because I think to do a lapidus well, you, you need to, to get the correction, you need to and to get adequate fixation in there, you need to have some space to work in this minimal, and I do minimal incision surgeries for certain things, but I think that it may not be a great choice for that, but we'll, that's to be determined. Um, Post-operative non-union rate was about 4%. I think it, the other, if you look at the literature as a whole, remember this was only 229, probably mostly orthopedic-based articles. Uh, and they were slow to bring into lapidus into Halix Vagus surgery. Also, remember that um, it's probably around five to ten percent. I think it's higher than what this is showing. Uh, Reoperation, other than hardware removal, uh, was actually the highest uh, at six point six percent. And then hardware removal was six percent. Also, uh, Halix Varus was relatively low at three uh, percent. Again, this is a lot of data. And so there's some really good information here. So uh, the worse the how what they found was the worse the hallux valgus angle, the higher the recurrence rate. Number one, number two, and this was for all procedures. The worse the IM angle, the higher the patient dissatisfaction rate. Um, and you can see some of these secondary findings like metatarsalgia dissatisfaction rate in, um, uh, uh, that are was listed on there. This is a really interesting article from Finland that looked at bunion surgeries from 1997 to 2014. Uh, there were 47,597 uh, 47, surgeries done over that time period to correct bunions. Um, way more, this normal kind of 80-20 um, rule for women having bunions versus men sort of was reinforced with this. And this top uh, graph here on the left the top line is women, so you can see how women went down significantly. The, the lower line are, are men having surgery over this time period. Uh, so the total occurrence for surgery uh, was 66.7 per 100,000 in 1997, and it went down to 41.4 per 100,000 in 2014. Men went from 10.1 to 6.2 per 100,000. Women dropped almost by half in 64 to 83, and I think a really interesting question is, okay, well, why were so many fewer women having bunion surgery in 1997 than 2014? Remember, the Finnish healthcare system is free, so it wasn't money. Money was not involved. The authors really didn't talk about this, but I think it's an interesting question. It's like, why are so many fewer women having bunion surgery? I think it's because more women are in the workplace and can't take time off work. That's what makes sense to me. The other thing that was really interesting is they broke things out by procedure. So we're gonna look at this, um, pie graph here on the top left in 1997, about half of them were getting a distal metatarsal osteotomy and almost half of them were getting a first MPJ implant. 
Um, this orange section is other procedures, and the yellow section was first in PJ arthrodesis, and lapidus isn't even on here. And if we come down to 2014, you can still see half of the procedures being selected were distal osteotomies. And basically, the first MPJ arthrodesis and implant arthroplasty, and I'm, an, I'm not an implant arthroplasty fan. I've written chapter, a chapter in a book why I don't like them. But they flip. They flip. So a lot more uh, people were doing uh, uh, first MPJ arthrodesis for hallux valgus, and far fewer were getting implants. I think we underutilize first MPJ arthrodesis for hallux valgus. I, it's one of my go-tos, and we'll talk more about that in some cases here in a second. But and now we start to see the lapidus become a little more popular at 8% of the procedures. Um, and this kind of just has all that on there. I'm just going to skip over this slide real quick. So I do the lapidus. Like I said, I don't think it's a it's the only procedure now to select from from bunions, but I think there are times in it to 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 do it. And this 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 case, um, bear with me for just a little bit on the bunion part of it. But this was a 26 year old woman with no history of injury. She had bilateral first MPJ pain. She had hallux lumbus, maybe a hot minor hallux vagus on the right, but. Um, here's her lateral on her left. Here's her lateral on the right. And you can see a pretty substantial deformity for a 26-year-old. She's a professional. She has to wear heels. She likes to exercise. She's in really good health. Um, but her big toes were killing her. And you can see uh, asymmetrical joint space loss, a little joint mouse here on the left at the lateral aspect, flattening of the first metatarsal. She has an arguably, she definitely had an elevated first ray on the lateral, and she has an arguably long first ray also. Uh, so sh she came to me and I made my recommendation. She got four other opinions. I think two of them were from foot and ankle orthopedic surgeons and two other podiatrists. And then she came back. So she had gotten five different surgical opinions on how to fix this. And she uh, was, she's kind of an emotional person. She was in tears and she's a super confused. So we just went through it and I said, well, here's why I think we need to do what we need to do. The one thing is, is she did not, she did not want, um, a first MPJ arthrodesis. She um, still has to wear heels, so that was a problem for her and her uh, activity, but that's a whole separate discussion. So what I recommended is, I'm a big, you have to treat the what and also treat the why person. So the why of this, she has clearly an elevated first ray and she has this junky aspect of the, of the distal aspect of the first metatarsal head. Um, so the what is the hallux ridges, hallux luminous problems, and for her, if I'm not doing a first MPJ arthrodesis, my next selection is a chylectomy, so a chylectomy. The why is she has this elevated first ray, maybe a little bit of a long first ray, that means you have to do a lapidus, so a lapidus chylectomy is what I chose. Intraoperatively, here's her arthritis and loss of cartilage, and that's pretty significant for a 26-year-old with no history of injury. Uh, I've been sort of underwhelmed by my um, uh, chylectomy procedure, so one of the things I like to do now is I'll inject some amniotic fluid intra-articular after I've um, done the procedure and close the capsule up. It helps to reduce post-operative adhesions significantly and really helps the post-op range of motion uh, as well. So here you can see I did an MIS fifth metatarsal osteotomy. I did a lapidus and an aggressive chylectomy on her, and her toes nice and straight. Um, and it's down, you can see the chylectomy. I took off uh, kind of at an angle to help with the first metatarsal range of motion. Here she is farther down the line healed. She ended up having both feet done and did really well. Here's the juvenile hallux valgus case. With juvenile hallux valgus, the bottom line is wait till the growth plates are closed, number one. Number two, probably a lapidus is the best. And number three, I usually will fix concomitant deformity. So here's a uh, about a 14, 15 year old female patient. Um, you can see a pretty significant bunion for a 14 or 15 year old with a flat foot deformity, particularly more probably transverse plane dominant than sagittal plane in this case. But I did an, a Bauman, an Evans, and a, uh, a Lapidus here. And you can see uh, sesamoids are back where they're supposed to be squaring off. If you look at the lateral aspect preoperatively here of the first metatarsal head, you can see it's rounded. And here you can see it's nice and squared off. Good alignment of the hallux onto the metatarsal because the sesamoids are in good position. Uh, and here's her lateral. You can see a significant improvement of the medial arch with the Evans combined with the lapidus. They both influence the sagittal plane deformity correction. Um, and you can see the first raise down and it looks like a really good uh, reduction of deformity. 
I still operate on patients. I do bone work on patients who smoke. Uh, I know some people don't, um, but when you do that, you're at risk for a non-union. And this is a lapidus non-union of mine. You can see uh, here's the preoperative bunion. She had a pretty hypermobile first ray. That's why I selected a lapidus. And you can see right here where we have an incomplete fusion site. Um, here's the lateral view. It doesn't show too much, but um, so I tried to take her back in. She failed a bone simulator. So we tried that first, went in and did um, a revision. So you have to remove it back to healthy bleeding bone. I used an allograft bone graft that's pre-cut for this area. And I soaked it in concentrated bone marrow aspirate, which basically makes it like autograft at that point. The other thing I want you to notice here is I used a longer plate, so stiffen up the construct a little bit. And I really stiffened the construct up by running this screw from the first metatarsal base to the second metatarsal base. So if, I'm ha if I have a, re uh, a re uh, redo or for a non-union or repair of a non-union for a lapidus, oftentimes I'll include this screw here. I also include this screw if there's a uh, uh, instability of the first ray compared to the central rays. Um, sometimes you can run a, um, an inner cuneiform screw, but this is also, but this has actually been shown to be the most effective, uh, most stable construct to stabilize the medial column of the foot to the central column of the foot. The PROMO procedure is kind of like a crescentic type proximal osteotomy. It's an oblique osteotomy. It closes with weight bearing. It uh, doesn't shorten very much. It does allow for correction in all three planes. Uh, it was uh, described this, you do need to know the uh, pre-op IM angle and the rotation angle. And if you're not sure, you can use that 22 degrees by Dayton and Kim because they're jigs that are used that you have to know the angle for it. Um, these, this procedure was developed by the Wagner brothers in South America. And they had, you know, a decent amount of people in their study with a, a not a bad follow-up of almost uh, three years and good correction of deformity. They showed good satisfaction rate and AOFAS scores. Uh, with very few complications. Um, I'm not going to show this whole video, but um, it's, um, here's an example of where I would do a promo type procedure. Um, so this is, would be a more severe deformity without any hypermobility of the first ray. So you can clearly see looking at the frontal view of this foot that there's rotation of the hallux, that it's in a rotated or valgus position. And this is a more significant deformity. And here you can see the sesamoids are rotated. And this is the osteotomy. It's just a lateral compression screw with a medial plate. And I decided to do an Aiken on this one as well. But here, look at the sesamoids are under the metatarsal. I did not resect the dorsal medial prominence. That's just the rotation. Um, I did nothing here at the metatarsal head level. And so this is width of the metatarsal. It looks much more narrow here. It's just because it's been derotated to the lateral side squared off. And that shows good reduction of deformity. And on the lateral view, there's no elevation like it's down like it should be. Here's a different uh, uh, promo procedure, pretty significant deformity. This is an older patient now. Every once in a while, I do think that the dorsal medial prominence is real and you do have to, to remove it. And that's more adaptive changes that have, when the deformity has been there for a, a longer period of time. So in this case, I did do, uh, I did resect the dorsal medial prominence here. I did the promo, I didn't do any kind of uh, uh, osteotomy up here distally, just resected the dorsal medial prominence. But look at how the lateral side squared off. Look at the sesamoids are seated where they're supposed to be and the hallux is nice and straight. And then here's the lateral, or if it's hard to get a post-op sesamoid view on patients after surgery just because it's uh, uncomfortable. But you can kind of, this is kind of a cool x-ray because you can kind of see where the osteotomy, it almost looks like a crescentic type osteotomy right through here. You can kind of see it a little bit on the x-ray right there. And then the lateral view showing no elevation, the first ray is down like it should be. Uh, first MPJ, arthrodesis. Uh, a lot of times when I'm talking about bunions, people are concerned that they're gonna, it's gonna make them walk differently if you fuse their big toe and their big toe joint doesn't, doesn't bend anymore. Is that true? Um, and this is a great article from Stevens in, in Foot and Ankle International in 2016. They had patients that had a, a fusion and, 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 and did a gait analysis on them. Um, uh, and then after their fusion was done and healed and compared that to a control group. And basically, they um, fused a little higher than I did. So they're fusing it at about 15 degrees dorsiflexion. I usually in between five and 10. 
So they were actually fusing a little bit higher than I do. The only thing that they noticed in spatial uh, temporal parameters for gait was compared to the fusion group to the control group was step width was a little more narrow, but otherwise they were all the same between the two groups. They also looked at the differences between the hind foot and tibia uh, relationship, the forefoot to hind foot relationship, and the forefoot to hallux relationship. And there were some minor changes, but really nothing significant between the patient group that had their big toes fused and the control group. They also looked at pressures. Now, one of the things that's interesting about this, and, and, and we'll talk about this in a little deeper here in a second, is there's about a 10% lesser metatarsalgia rate um, after a first MPJ arthrodesis. And that seems like counterintuitive when you just think about it initially, but because as you dorsiflex the hallux, you're going to plantar flex the first metatarsal. And they did show that the first metatarsal uh, was taking more weight after surgery, but it wasn't statistically significant. What was statistically significant is there was a lot more lateral transfer of, the, of pressure uh, between the, to the lesser toes and the lesser metatarsals and even to the midfoot a little bit. And that just goes to show you what that means is how much pressure is going through the hallux in the third rocker gate as you're towing off that because it's dorsiflexed in a fixed position is now being dumped laterally. And um, other studies have shown about a 10% metatarsalgia rate uh, after this procedure. So that makes sense. That explains that 10% metatarsalgia rate. So that's something you need to talk to your patients about preoperatively that they might need orthotics with after, uh, after surgery, after having their big toes fused, because you may have a little bit of weight distribution change after the big toes fused, and that's where orthotics can be helpful. Uh, but what they showed in the study was the hind foot and the forefoot compensate for lost first MPJ motion post arthrodesis, um, increased pressures under the lesser METs, um, and lower pressure under the hallux. That shows you how much pressure goes to that hallux at the end of the third rocker. Um, now, it has to go somewhere, so it's going laterally over to the lesser mets. Uh, first metatarsal did show slight increase in, in, in pressure, but not significant. And that their results indicate that the foot has an intrinsic capacity to compensate for lost motion of the hallux uh, after a fusion. So to the point where it functions the exact same as somebody that has a perfectly normal big toe. So you can tell them it doesn't affect their gait at all is the bottom line. We know for hallux limits, it has by far the best evidence and, and, and is uh, the highest rated for hallux limits, hallux ridges. Um, another question is, okay, well, how's my foot gonna function? You know, how am I gonna get around during the day? Am I gonna be able to do my normal activities? And this was another really good article in Foot and Ankle International, looked at the functional outcomes of first MPJ arthrodesis. Um, so they had a decent follow-up of 3.3 years here. Um, a couple of things with hallux valgus. Uh, there's a lot of there's hundreds of articles constantly in the kind of 80 to 90, 80 to 95 percent success rate or satisfaction rate. Most people would undergo the procedure again. Um, one of the things you have to be leery of if you're talking about a first MPJ arthrodesis with a patient is women in the 40 to 60 uh, year age group um, that still want to wear high heels. There is a limitation on heel height, and the literature says it's about an inch and a half to two inches. So if you have a patient that may need a first MPJ arthrodesis that is a female patient and wants to wear three inch heels, if everything is healed perfectly, they're still gonna be unsatisfied because they can't wear the shoe gear they wanna wear. So have that conversation with the patient up front. You wanna ask them what their goals are. What kind of shoes do you wanna wear uh, after this? And then, you know, if they don't care about heel height, then fine, that's great, shoot for it because this is the most predictable procedure there is. And um, it's one of my favorite, two favorite surgeries to do. So, but there is some limitation on shoe wear, particularly with heel height, about an inch and a half to two inches. The other thing you should talk to them about preoperatively is that their toe's not going to touch the ground in that it's not going to be perfectly straight, particularly if you're doing this for hallux valgus. It has a slight valgus position to accommodate for the break of the shoes. So the angle of the front part of the shoe is called the shoe break. And, and you need to let them know that the toe is not supposed to touch the ground and that it's going to um, be a, not perfectly straight because it's not supposed to be. So 
In this study, only 60% believe their foot looked better post-op. It's just because preoperatively they didn't tell them what to expect. So have that conversation beforehand. Um, they looked at all these different outcome measurements and they were all significant, significantly better after having their first MPJ fused. Number one, the thing that went up the highest from the preoperative score to the postoperative score was quality of life. Whether it's hallux valgus or hallux ridges, you can significantly improve somebody's quality of life by fusing their big toe joint. The thing that had the highest postoperative score altogether was the improvement in daily activities. So going up and down stairs, going shopping, taking the dog for a walk. That had uh, the highest score post operatively, and, and that's what the that's what people want. They want to be able to resume those normal activities without pain, and that's how you improve their quality of life. Um, can you run after your first uh, after your first MPJ fusion? Well, um, there's in the literature it's been reported patients have run marathons with their big toes fused. I've had numerous patients who run five, six, seven miles you know, several times a week after their big toes have been fused in uh, some serious exercise, hardcore exercise people go back to their normal routines. And this study showed that linear things like running, uh, jogging, uh, walking for exercise were significantly better after their big toes were fused. Uh, sports that involve side to side motion were better, but didn't have as much improvement. So like tennis, things like that. This is a great study because it has a 15 year follow up and it compared Halix, uh, Arthur D, Hall first MPJ arthrodesis to implant arthroplasty. And this is a Kaplan Meyer plot that shows the two groups and it shows these little blips. And the blips are revision surgery. Um, six of the um, uh, implant arthroplasty of 39 had to have revision, and only one in the arthrodesis group, and that was intraoperative positioning due to surgeon error. The, the, the sort of take home message for this at 90, uh, uh, at 15 point years, the patient satisfaction rate was 96.3% in the arthrodesis group, which was significantly better than the arthroplasty group. The pain level was significantly better than the arthroplasty group. So both of those factors at 15 point year, 2.2 years were significantly better. The other thing to, to keep in mind is, if you have a failed implant and you go back in and fix it, and it, even if everything goes perfectly well, only half the time the patients were satisfied. So you have this 96.3% satisfaction rate at 15.2 years, and the risk of things not going well and having to revise it, and then if everything still goes perfect, only half the time the patients are gonna be satisfied. It just doesn't you know, make sense to do implant arthroplasty in my opinion. And it's a procedure that I, I'm, I just do not like any type of implant arthroplasty. And um, I may do one once every decade, but that's about it. And it has to be a very unique situation for me to select that. And the, the authors in the Stone study said that um, basically arthrodesis outperformed out, uh, arthroplasty in all measures. So I do get a lot of unusual type revision surgery in my practice, and, and this is a patient that came in that had a really poorly done lapidus. And there's a lot of things wrong with this. They also had a distal metatarsal osteotomy, which I'm not a fan of any of them. And they had an intramedullary implant placed in the second PIPJ that was dislocated second MPJ. They had pain there, they had pain in the first MPJ, they had pain in the lateral foot because of the way they're walking. Um, so, you know, they've already undergone a really bad experience in their, you know, they're unable to do the things they want to do. You know, how do you fix this? You have some intercaneiform arthrodesis that's occurred with the lapidus. Are you going to break all that part and redo the lapidus? I, when I'm doing revision surgery, I really try to follow the KISS principle, which is keep it simple, stupid, and I'm the stupid one. And for me in this case, you know, trying to redo the lapidus is not as predictable as getting linked back out by doing a first MPJ arthrodesis with a bone graft just doing a, a capsulotomy, really freeing up the second MPJ and pinning it and letting it all scar in in a straight position. Uh, now I've got some things I got to work around with the toe and the, and the metatarsal to do that. And we have a very short first ray here to, to, do, to bring back out to link. So, but that's what I chose. So here you can see, I did a first MPJ arthrodesis. I just ignored what was going on proximally and, and tried to reestablish the link distally with a bone graft and a plate really nice long plate here. And then I freed up the uh, MPJ and just pinned it uh, around the intermedullary implant and, uh, and got the toe back into alignment. 
Um, one of the things when you're using a graft on a first MPJ orthodesis, you have two points of healing now instead of one. And if you use a plate that doesn't allow a screw to go into the graft to stabilize the graft to the plate, you have shimmy that occurs between the graft host interface. And what happens a lot of the time is distally, the distal graft host interface is, is slow to heal or won't heal. So when you add a screw to the plate uh, that goes into the graft, when you have that available and you can just kind of smash everything together and then hold it st still with uh, the plate and screws, um, both sides tend to heal very well. So this is a pre-cut graft based on the uh, anatomic area uh, to match the reamers that go with this set and then it's soaked in concentrated bone marrow aspirate. So basically at that point, it's the exact same as an autograft. And you, here you can see the graft uh, and distal graft host interface, proximal graft host interface, interface and you can see the screw going in uh, the graft to stabilize it. And you can see the pin here uh, to, to stabilize the MPJ. I had to pin around this intramedullary implant, but she ended up healing very well. Here's another one with a, a very short first ray due to an Austin bunionectomy that's led to these windswept toe deformities and a, and a Taylor's bunion. Um, with an, another, I don't like these intermedullary implants at all. They're, they're a problem if you have to go back in and do something. Uh, so here, similar thing. I did a MIS fifth. Uh, I did a, a first MPJ arthrodesis with a graft. Uh, I, on this one, I just re revised the uh, MPJ and uh, pinned around this uh, implant and did an arthroplasty on the third. Actually, I should have done the fourth and this kind of drifted back over and had to recently go back in and do her fourth toe, but uh, this all healed up really well and she did uh, great otherwise. This is a, a female patient with what I would consider a severe hallux valgus deformity, and she did not care about high heels. So for me, this is a slam dunk. This is a, I'll do a first MPJ fusion on this all day, every day, and twice on Sunday. And that's what, she, what I did on her with the standard plate that I usually use. And you can see it healed really nicely. Great alignment, um, uh, full incorporation of the arthrodesis side, and she did really well. Uh, the Siri procedure is a minimal incision Homan. Uh, done distally. It's also called a Bosch procedure. So it's a straight medial to lateral through and through. This is a middle-aged male. He's a firefighter actually. And you can see this is a pretty moderate, you know, moderate kind of heading towards a severe deformity with cystic changes here. Um, pretty abnormal sesamoid position. Um, and here's the Siri procedure. So I use two pins to fixate this. Uh, it's a through and through osteotomy, just a two stitch incision immediately. This is a two millimeter, nine inch double ended pin. I like to take it all the way into the navicula. This pin locks in the transverse plane and the frontal plane. And how you do that is, so you push the pin in by hand before you even do the osteotomy. You start at the base of the distal phalanx medially and you kind of sky, you want to hug the bone here. And this is real similar to X-Fix technique, technique two. Um, and you come up and to just behind the oste where the osteotomy is going to be and you do the osteotomy. And then you have to deflect the pin from being extra articular to intra articular. Uh, and then you take it to the base. And that once you get it to the base, you're going to take the hallux and turn it so the toenail straight up and down to take the rotation out. Now you're rotating at the osteotomy site, right where Oda said that that torsional deformity is occurring within the metatarsal. Um, and then when you drive the pin past the first mechaniform joint, so once you go multi-cortical, and then I like to go all the way into the navicula, now you've locked the frontal plane and transverse plane. When I started doing these, I've done probably almost 300 of them now, the, I was seeing a little trans or sagittal plane movement, so I added a second pin, which is how we used to fixate Austin's when I was a resident, with a 6-2 wire from dorsal distal lateral plantar proximal medial. Now look at this. First, the sesamoids are great, great position. Secondly, the lateral side squared off really nicely. The third is I did nothing to that dorsal medial prominence in the pre-op film. And that was a pretty substantial, quote unquote, dorsal medial prominence with all these cystic changes. I didn't take that off. It's all rotation. Um, everybody gets freaked out about this fixation. This is a very stable fixation because you have not released, with this procedure's extra articular, you have not released the capsule. You have not released any ligaments. So this is creating a tension band effect. And look on this oblique view. This is a two millimeter pen. This is a really robust pen. Look at the arc on that and how much force that that is creating 
stabilizing this first mat against the soft tissue and even to the second mat a little bit in the transverse and frontal planes. So these will uh, fill in with bone over here and this kind of smooths off this edge here. And this does have almost like an S shape to it. So the anatomic axis is kind of wacky, but if you look at the mechanical axis, the center point of the first mechaniform joint and the center point of the first MPJ is perfectly straight. And that's what you want. That's what's important, the mechanical axis, not the anatomical axis. Um, this was a patient that, um, a pediatric patient with a bunion deformity and, and a kind of a transverse plane dominant flat foot. So I took her in like the uh, one I mentioned earlier and did a Lapidus and a, an Evans and a Bauman on her. And, it, and I, I work really hard on when I'm in surgery on my Lapidus procedures to really get the deformity corrected in all three planes. And, you know, in, initially postoperatively, I was pretty satisfied. I thought that, you know, the sesamoids were in good position. The lateral side was squared off and the hallux looked like it was in good alignment. And then, but over a period of months, the hallux started to drift back over. And uh, I have published a paper on how often you have to remove these uh, bridge plates for Evans, and it's about 30% of the time. And it's because of perineal tendonitis that the plate can irritate the tendon. So I was gonna have to go in and remove her plate for her uh, tendonitis from the irritation of that. And I talked to her and her parents about fine tuning this bunion procedure. So I said, let me, do this minimal incision procedure and, and get this toe straighter than it is now because it was driving me crazy. And that's what I did. So I took out the Evans here, left all this in because I wasn't bothering her. I did the Siri procedure and you can see now um, the sesamoids are where they're supposed to be. The lateral side squared off. The hallux is nice and straight. Took her pins out. She healed very nicely uh, in, the, in a much more rectus position with that approach. And when I did her left foot, which was not as bad, actually I just did the Bauman Evans and I did a Siri procedure on it instead of a lapis because she didn't have the uh, instability, the medial calm that she had with the other, uh, other foot. And this is how that healed. And again, the mechanical axis is perfectly straight. Don't get, don't get like freaked out by looking at the anatomic axis. And this all will smooth off with time and it kind of looks like a little bit of an S, but the mechanical axis is perfectly straight. So that's all. If you would like a PDF of my lecture, you just have to hold your phone up and that will send you a link to the, um, uh, my Google Drive to be able to uh, get that. And if you have any questions, you can type in questions in the Q&A session. I'll be glad to answer those for a few minutes. Um, first question is, do I have an answer for, or do I have a limit for the I, uh, minimal incision procedure for the IM angle? I do. Um, it's about, uh, what I would classify as a moderate bunion. So 15 or so degrees IM angle. I think above that, you probably need to look at the, the proximal osteotomy or lapidus or first MPJ fusion. Well, I hope that you uh, got something out of this lecture. Uh, another question is, how long does it take for the medial step off to smooth out and why not take it off during the procedure? I don't wanna take it off during the procedure because that pin is going right through that area and I'm afraid if you weaken that medial cortex, it can lead to a stress riser. Um, so that's always been a concern of mine. The literature shows that it, it clearly um, smooths off. I've only had one patient that it was a problem and I was pushing the envelope on the procedure. She had a bunion deformity that was probably a little bigger really than that was intended for that procedure. And um, it did bother her. I had to take her back in and do it as a secondary procedure. It's only one of like 250 to 300 procedures that it's bothered anybody. It usually will uh, remodel on its own. And I don't want to take the chance of it creating a stress riser and the whole medial side of the first metatarsal fracture out.
Well, thank you everybody for joining and um, we'll send out information for next week's uh, lecture if you want to join. Have a great day.